In your home, school, cafe, there are lots of computing devices talking to one another, downloading email, visiting websites, getting updates, posting photos, etc. How does the network handle all updates, posting photos, etc.? How does the network handle all this happening, seemingly, at the same time? Can you imagine a classroom of 25 people who are all asking a different question at the same time? Well, let's look at how we communicate when we as humans are in a group. You can see why we raise our hands to ask or answer a question. It stops everyone else talking and we get sole access to the communications channel in an ideal world anyway, but then computers can be programmed to be very play by the rules. Good behavior, good computer. Only one of us can speak at a time, usually. More than that becomes confusing because we can only listen to one person at a time unless they're all saying the same thing, like in a choir. There's a similar problem with communications. Now, if we look at aircraft and communication between aircraft, we can see that this problem was solved to a certain extent even before computers were invented. So maybe we could learn from that experience. Here's a view of a quiet part of Australia's skies and you can see four aircraft. If I wanted to talk to them, it wouldn't be terribly difficult. I'd need to know their name, and I'd need to wait for any other conversations to finish. But this becomes slightly harder when we look at busier routes. Can you imagine trying to talk to all of these different aircraft, or one of all of these different aircraft? This happened, of course, before what we've just experienced in 2020, which is the COVID-19 virus shutdown. There wouldn't be anywhere near the number of aircraft in the sky as there is in this slide. But that will change. It'll come back again. So let's start at the beginning and see how we can fix this and look at some communication guidelines. I need to make sure that I know all of these things. I need to know who I'm talking to, who you are, who I am, what information you've got, what you want to know, and how do I know that if I told you to land on runway 34 that you actually got that information and didn't land on a different runway and crash into another plane. It's considered unfriendly in some airports. So these are things called protocols. They're an agreed way of doing something. And protocols have been adopted by radio communicators worldwide, and as we'll see, by computers as well. Let's look at some of the other aspects of protocols. If there's a poor reception, poor radio reception, or people don't speak clearly, communication can be bad. So in areas where accurate communication is vital, like bushfires, police, ambulance, etc., or in the military, letters are sounded out in what's known as the International Phonetic Alphabet. So A is Alpha, B is Bravo, etc. The final choice of code words was made after hundreds of thousands of comprehension tests with 31 different nationalities. But they can still be problems with pronunciation. The pronunciation of the numbers 3, 5 and 9 sounds a little bit weird, 3 is tree, and 5 is fife, and 9 is niner, but it avoids confusion between the numbers 5 and 9, which could sound the same in a noisy environment or perhaps with an accent. A speaker might pronounce 3 as free, and there could be confusion between the words 5 and fire. And the German word 9, meaning no, could be confused with the number 9 and so forth. So they might sound weird, but their meaning is clear if you know the code and if you follow the protocol. So listen to these communications between the first officer, sometimes called the co-pilot, of a Batavia Airlines flight and the air traffic controller at Polonia International Airport in Indonesia. Polonia Tower, Batavia 
During communications, both the first officer and the control tower speak in English, even though this isn't their first language. The communications protocol for aircraft worldwide is to use one common language for communications, and that language is English. You can hear numerals read out individually. Batavia is the name of the airline, and 594 is the unique identifier of the aircraft, like its number plate. The first officer calls the control tower and the tower responds with both the caller's ID and its own ID, so it's clear who is talking to whom. So now the first officer has finished taking on passengers and is ready to start the engines. He calls the tower and again the tower responds with both the caller's ID and its own ID, so it's clear who is talking to whom. So the first officer responds with his ID and states where the plane is, parking stand number four. PAB stands for passengers on board, in this case 175. The intended flight level, 33,000 feet, and then asks for permission to start the engines. Note that some information is abbreviated for clarity and the abbreviations are the same worldwide. A pushback means reversing the aircraft out of the parking stand and the first officer calls the tower and the tower responds with both the caller's ID and its own ID so it's clear who's talking to whom again. After being told that start is approved, the first officer repeats that instruction in his response so that the tower knows that its instruction was understood correctly. So what can we learn from all this? Well, we have to have protocols, which are agreed ways of doing things. English is the internationally agreed language, although domestic flights may operate in that country's language. Radio is a shared medium. Anyone with the right equipment can listen and transmit. So it's important that we know who is talking to whom. Abbreviations and words with special meaning are used for clarity. In any case, the receiver repeats the message back to the sender. The repeat last message protocol works well with human voices because the messages are short and the words are predictable, but computer-to-computer -computer data has to be faster. We all want our movies to be smooth and jitter-free as possible, and you're never sure what data is actually going to be sent. It's not predictable. But we can't repeat them back to the sender necessarily in computers because that would take too long. So how can we fix errors in transmission? So we first need to realise that computers don't actually send text. They send a code. Every letter has a binary code, which is represented by a series of electricals ons and offs, which actually presents as an additional problem. Let's look at the character O in hello, just that last character. The seven bits of binary that represent the O in ASCII are sent down the wire or over wires as a series of ons and offs. What happens if one of the bits gets corrupted and turns into the only other thing it can be, a zero? Now we get something totally different. We get H-E-L-K. And H-E-L-K is not what we were expecting. Now let's check the 7-bit code for the letter to see if it has an even number of 1s. This is one way in which we could do some error correction. If it's 6, which is an even number, we'll add a 0. An extra bit makes up 8 bits in total, which is also called 1 byte, 
and we can send it. Off we go. So let's check this 7-bit code for the letter to see if it has an even number of 1s. It has 5. It's not even. So we'll add 1, making an even number of 1s, and then send it. And that means that the receiver is always expecting an even number of 1s. So it counts the number of 1s, and if it's even, and it says, OK, that's correct, I've got what I wanted, I've got what is sent, then let's go ahead and decode it, and it decodes it into an O. However, if the number of ones is not even, they know that it's wrong, and they can send a message back to the sender saying, can you say again? Can you send that once more, please? So the, this is an example of a simple error-checking algorithm. There are more complex ones out there that can cope with two errors in the same byte, for example, which this one wouldn't necessarily cope with. You may want to pause the video here so you can go through these flowcharts again. Computer communications are pretty good now, so the chance of an error is fairly small, so resends don't need to be requested all that often. Now let's get back to our classroom and imagine that every computer is well behaved, just like all the students. How can we stop every computer from speaking at once? A computer connected to a basic network will listen to the wire or wireless signal to see if anyone else is speaking and the other computer wants to send a message. If that's the case, then it will wait a random period of time and then it'll try again. And if no one's on the line, it will attempt to send a chunk of data. If there's a collision, then it will hang off for a moment and wait for a quiet time and then send the next chunk. This process is what's called the link layer of networks. And again, you might want to pause the video to have a look at that flowchart or maybe reverse the video so that you can go through that once more. Of course, there's a problem here in that the message is available for any device on this network, just like the mail is available for everyone in the house to open. Again, a protocol is used for mail. No one opens other people's emails and other people's letters. And for communications, it's the same you don't read other people's messages. So how does the receiving device that knows knows that the message So how does the receiving device know that the message is for it so that it reads it and doesn't ignore it? Each network capable device has a unique identifier just like an envelope does. And that unique identifier is a number. Now that number looks a bit weird because it's in a, the base 16, not the base 10 we're usually used to, or base 2 that is binary. It's just a different way of expressing numbers. If you really want to go into it, this is how base 16 works. 0 through 15 in the decimal system Base 10, what we normally use for arithmetic, goes from 0 and then uses the letters A, B, C, D, E, F to represent the numbers 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. And there's a decode there if you're really interested in going any further with that. But we can just go with it being a number. So the information that we actually want to send starts to look a little bit like this. We need to know who sent it, where it was destined for, what data you want to send, and we need an error check. And that's if we're on a network. When you're sending it to a uh, printer, for argument's sake, instead of the to and from, they're not really needed because there's only one thing sending and one thing receiving. So that makes it a little bit easier. But on a network, we need to have those additional addresses at the beginning. So let's go back to our classroom 
and investigate a bit further. The connections may look like this in a classroom, but they're actually hooked up a little bit differently. They're usually hooked to a thing called a switch, which is often in a cabinet which may be hidden in a room or in a back room, or maybe it's on the wall inside a locked cabinet. The switch is called a switch because it makes a single connection or switches the whole network so that the source and destination are given a clear path of removing any chance of collision with any other data. So they don't have to use the collision avoidance technique described earlier, although Wi-Fi still uses a modified version of the collision avoidance because every computer is using the same wireless connection. They're on a shared connection. So if you were to have a look around in your computer room, you may see a device that looks like this where things are plugged into sockets. So when a computer wants to send a message, like a file to a local server or perhaps a, an email to a local mail server, it's given a clear path by the switch with no interference from other traffic. Now switching happens very, very quickly, but there is a limit. Too many machines connected to the same switch would overload the switching capacity of the switch. So how do we connect to the internet with billions of devices? Well, we'll explore that in the next video.